Sure. Uh, I'm going to say I, that I'm very excited to have uh, Jess Enright speak today in the uh, Women in Network Science Seminar. Jess is an absolutely amazing speaker, uh, and you'll hear that for yourself in a minute. Um, she's going to talk about um, uh, epidemics in networks in, of people and animals. Uh, I sent the paper link out recently. I'm really excited to hear on this topic that basically everybody is talking about uh, from a person who's done a lot of work in that field. So take it away, Jess. Thank you. Such a kind introduction. It's always like terrifying how authoritative it makes. It makes you sound when people introduce you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm I'm really happy to be <laughs> to be doing this talk. Um, I, I hope it's useful and interesting to people. Uh, so I thought before I really started in on the paper, I'd do a little introduction because I think that's the bit that we miss uh, from not having these in-person events. It's kind of getting getting to know each other. Um, so I'm hi, I'm Jess. Uh, I'm a lecturer in computing at the University of Glasgow. I'm not originally from Scotland. You can probably tell I'm Canadian originally. Uh, so I did a PhD uh, at the University of Alberta a long time ago now, I finished in 2011, so I should be a grown-up theoretically by this point. Um, this is uh, me in Prince Edward Island in my mum's place, um, and, uh, and I thought I would outline for you some of my likes. I enjoy graphs and networks, D&D, lots of other, other nerd things, dogs. Uh, this is not my dog, my dog is also adorable. Um, and rugby. I dislike pandemics and lockdowns, just putting that out there. Uh, in case, um, in case anybody, you know, has has any doubt. If you're in favor of pandemics and or lockdowns, you can get right out. We are not friends anymore. Okay, uh, so let's let's start talking about about business. So I chose this paper um, partly because I know some of the people involved. Uh, it's just a preprint. Um, I'm sure it'll it'll end up somewhere somewhere suitable. Um, Shweta uh, Banzal and uh, Vittoria Kalitsa are uh, at least in this list, both female. Um, the Banzal Lab is, is fantastic and does some really exciting kind of networks and biology and epidemiology stuff. So I, I highly recommend keeping an eye on their work. Uh, Ewan uh, Coleman, I also know, not female, um, but still a good person, despite that fact, uh, works at the University of <clears throat> Edinburgh and I do, I do some work with, with him. So it's always nice to read papers by people, by people you know. Um, and this is about social fluidity uh, in, in networks. <coughs> Excuse me. So what I've done here uh, is I've pulled out in the usual way some figures and a little bit of the math from the paper. I thought we'd talk through that. I do also have the paper somewhere and can share it if people have things they want to say. Uh, if you super want me to stop talking so you can say something, feel free to say in the chat. I'm keeping the chat open so that I can, I can catch any of those. Okay. Um, oh, for those of you who don't know, because I, I kind of assumed uh, everyone does, uh, Vittoria Kalitsa here is really sort of a powerhouse in the uh, livestock epidemiology network science community. So she, her, her group uh, also produces a, a vast quantity of, of very good work. Uh, so, so keep an eye out for that as well. These other people in the middle I don't know as well, but I'm sure they're great also. Okay, so the headline message of this paper, in my opinion, <clears throat> is essentially this parameter that they've described, a parameter of a network um, that uh, they use to model different distributions of social effort over contacts. Uh, and then for me, because I do disease spread, a second interesting thing they do is to derive a relationship between this parameter and a, a, a basic reproductive number. So they do kind of a, a modified basic reproductive number of a disease related to this um, social mobility, social fluidity measure. Um, if you're an epidemiologist, uh, a subheadline is that, uh, as, you, as you kind of might expect, very socially fluid uh, settings lead to density-dependent transmission of disease and very stable social bonds lead to frequency-dependent transmission. We'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later if, uh, if people are interested in, and we have time. <clears throat> okay. So um, what's this, this social fluidity idea about? So <clears throat> I think one of the points they were trying to get across, and one that I agree with, and I'm sure, I'm sure I'm preaching partly to the converted here, is that degree distributions, while delightful and important, are not the only thing about a network or graph, right? And so trying to consider other things about networks when we're looking at controlling disease or understanding the vulnerability of a network to disease can be really important. So they wanted to capture this notion of um, kind of how, if I can put it another way, how loyal uh, individuals in a network are. 
Um, so for example, uh, if I'm, <clears throat> oh, excuse me. I'm just gonna turn off my email so that that doesn't happen again. Let's bring back preview. Can you still see the, the slides? Give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down, Alice. Thumbs up, excellent, okay. Um, so the idea here is that uh, they want this parameter to capture the, the difference between someone like in this, this top figure who has a whole bunch of contacts and kind of spends equal time with all of them. So that's probably a small amount of time. So like a social butterfly who changes contacts all the time. And when they have a new social interaction is very likely to be with someone that they've never met before, as opposed to someone who they say disproportionate or they call it allegiant, which is pleasingly sci-fi sounding. Um, who has far more intense contacts with, with a few people, right? Um, and this is probably more normal for, for most humans, right? A lot of intense contact with friends and family. And then, for example, I have a lot of kind of eh, here and there contact with students, which is, you know, fairly, uh, fairly light touch. I very, you know, very rarely, I don't know, bring them food or, or pat their heads or anything like that. Um, another situation I thought we could use to, to keep this difference in mind is, is just the, the, the difference that we've seen in ourselves uh, pre to post lockdown, right? Like previously I had some contacts that I spent a lot of effort on uh, and then some I spent a medium effort on and then some I only saw occasionally. Um, so I was somewhere between disproportionate and evenly distributed. Uh, whereas now I basically only see my husband and my dog. So like I spend an enormous amount of social effort on them, right? And almost all my interactions uh, are with them and I have no weight on interactions with with anybody else right so i'm now completely disproportionate if you wanted to say well in jessica's next physical social interaction what's the probability it's going to be with someone she's never seen before vanishingly low really unlikely right so that's this idea it's meant to describe this difference between these gregarious this higher curve of people um, who as they have more interactions have more partners versus the the people who uh tend to have a lot of interactions with the same person and of course, it makes sense that this from a disease perspective might be might be quite important and it, it does turn out to be. All right. So that's that's kind of the intuition and the motivation of this measure. Uh, I should have pointed out, you can see here on the right, we've got this little phi here. Uh, phi is their measure. Uh, and if phi is bit much bigger than one, then it's very socially fluid and changes partners all the time. And if phi is much smaller than one, uh, then uh, then we have low social fluidity. I should also mention, I guess, before we continue, uh, that this is the kind of the impact of social fluidity and partner switching is, is not um, altogether a new idea, right? Like we've known for quite a while that this is really important for HIV transmission, for example, that kind of overlapping partner switches is, is uh, really dangerous in, in sexual uh, disease transmission. Okie dokie. Uh, so let's do a bit, bit of notation and a little bit of math here. Uh, um, Vertices are i and j in what, what I've written here. Um, the, uh, oh, sorry, there's an excited dog who's de decided that it's zooming time behind me. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, edges have weights uh, denoted with this w. So w i j is the weight of an edge uh, between i and j. That's meant to be like the number of interactions, yeah? So for me right now, again, this weight of, of the interaction between me and my dog is enormous. The weight of the interaction between me and say the person at my shopping uh, grocery place is very low. We do have an interaction, but it's, it's very, uh, very rare and very light. Um, they define for vertex I the strength of that, uh, that vertex. That's just the sum of all of the weights. Now I checked to see, um, they, in this paper, uh, edges are undirected, right? So uh, it's, it's weights um, in or out, those are not, those are not distinguished. Uh, the degree uh, is not weighted, so it's just the number of distinct partners um, that I has. And derived from that is simply x of j given i is the probability uh, that an edge that you're told involves i also involves j, right? It's not super important that you remember these things. I wrote them down partly while I was reading the paper to help me think through it. Okay, uh, then what they're interested in is this notion of a row, uh, so it's the, the distribution of all of these different probabilities over all pairs of vertices or nodes, excuse me, in the, in the network. So um, they're, they really want to talk about this marginal probability of an edge between a node that has some known strength s, and this is a, a, an expression that they've written down for it. This is just an integration over, over sorry, that should be a one minus x, not one equal to x there. Um, sorry, <laughs> I don't know if you can hear her behind me, uh, but she's having a really fantastic time, this dog. I almost want to remove my background image just so that 
just so that you can see her, but I can't figure out how to do that. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, so there's this notion of kind of this distribution of probabilities over, over pairs of vertices, and they say that finding a, a sensible form for this is, is one of the big goals of the paper. Now, uh, the form that they find for it, or decide to use, uh, is, is power, which is convenient for us, because probably a, a form that functional form that we're, we're very used to, right? And they have this parameter uh, five, as I said, that they use as a social fluidity parameter. Right? So uh, I don't want to dwell too much on this this particular <laughs> power law function here, um, but the notion is just that we have this distribution. Uh, it's uh, parameterized by phi, uh, and the decline is is following this power law. Yeah. So phi is the parameter that you twiddle uh, to change the social mobility in the graph. Uh, epsilon is just here to truncate the distribution so you don't get kind of funny end bits to your distribution. So you could you could kind of do this without uh, epsilon and you would just get some impossible graphs, uh, networks, excuse me. Okay. So that's a bit of the, the mathematical definition there. And I just wanted to bring this back all together with this with this very helpful figure. I really enjoyed this figure a lot, by the way, uh, in this paper. I thought this was really helpful um, to say, like, here we are, uh, just to remind us, um, this distribution here, row with this mathematical form, that's what they've plotted uh, over here, kind of on the right, right? So um, they fixed the phi here that was very big, and look how, how, how skew that is, whereas you can fix this phi much smaller than one, and it's much flatter. So that's, that's really the intuition of this. Um, this uh, this functional form for okay, so that's convenient to use for a number of reasons. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, one of the the things they do then with this is to take a whole bunch of data, uh, different data sets, all public, uh, which is nice. So you could you could go and try it yourself if you wanted to. Uh, the code is up there as well. I had a quick look. It's 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 fairly uh, well maintained and usable. So if if it tickles your fancy, uh, go ahead and give it a give it a try. Um, so they take a bunch of these data sets of interactions. Now, the, this list uh, in this figure on the right are, is kind of a general description of what these different data sets are. Of course, what, what counts as a contact is, is different in these different data sets, right? Like the contact between cattle is unlock, likely to be the same type as uh, between, say, two office workers or between two bats. Um, but, but regardless, uh, th there's this notion of, of contact in all of these, in all of these data sets. So they, they fit uh, these data sets, or they fit that function to these data sets, uh, changing their social fluidity parameter until it's a, a good fit, without going too much into, into how they do this fitting. It's, it's not too complicated, and it's really based on uh, the relationship between strength and degree. So that's that weighted degree and simple degree in the network. Um, in a way that makes it kind of feasible to fit across networks that have sort of wildly different sizes. Um, and, and I think this is kind of, this is a really cool uh, figure as well. Um, so they've got these, yeah, hopefully most of you can see colors. Uh, I can see most of these colors. Um, they plot these, the social fluidity um, along here, and they're just kind of in, there's not really anything special on the x-axis. They've just grouped them by different types of interaction. And it's kind of pleasing that you can see that the things here sort of make sense, right? Like grooming interactions have really low social fluidity, right? So grooming tends to be between uh, really loyal and persistent partnerships. So uh, who's doing the grooming? Monkeys here, yeah. So when monkeys groom, it's mostly close social acquaintances, I guess, or family members. Uh, those are persistent partnerships. Whereas up here, we have uh, aggression in monkeys and aggression in parakeets. And sheep, I really like the idea of aggression in sheep. I haven't encountered that that much. Um, but that aggression has really high social fluidity, right? Mostly people uh, or people, uh, individuals here are aggressive with individuals they've not interacted with before. Yeah? And they kind of have this, this, of course, not perfect, but kind of this general uh, decline of social fluidity across these categories. Uh, that sort of makes sense. Also, I'd not heard of uh, antenation before, but it's a, an ant thing. So they, they apparently come up and sort of interact with their antenna. So every day's a school day. All right. So that's kind of this nice practical example, excuse me, of, of what this social fluidity means in these systems. And it's a sanity check that in practice, it's a at least somewhat useful parameter. It seems to sort of capture uh, something about the, the kind of interaction uh, that is that is going on here. Okay.
So I wanted to turn then to the associated infection measure uh, that, they, that they derived um, and talk a, a little bit about that because infection is, is, at least these days, definitely my day job, not normally, but uh, for the past couple of months. Um, so they, they looked at a really simple disease transition model. Uh, if you've ever written a, an SI, I'm not sure actually whether it's SIS or SIR, I, um, I, I think it's SIR. Uh, model. This is probably uh, this is probably the the one. Let me see. What is association? Let me let me go back here. Uh, association in which sense, Alice? In the sense that it's uh, it's one of the things on the x-axis. Oh right. Oh, I don't remember. Uh, yeah, we can look it up. Association. I guess it's some sort of uh, pers well. What I'm about to say is just it, 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 what's kind of shown here, which is it's, I guess it's some sort of persistent partnership. But I, I, I don't know, according to the paper is defined as co-membership of the same social group. That's a little bit tautological, but yeah, okay. Thanks, Maria. This is great. This is way better. So I'm, I, I'm really sold on this. I'm never presenting my own work again because this way other people know the answers to things. I like it a lot better. It must be pretty, um, I was a little worried at first actually uh, when I decided to do this that there might be one of the authors present, which I suppose is possible. And that must be really nerve wracking, watching someone else present one of your papers in a, in a journal club. That must be really scary. Mm -hmm. okay. mm. Yeah, if everyone trusts each other and is really kind of in the right spirit, I think it would be, I think it's a, a good thing. I, I'm thinking of like implementing this at, uh, at research group meetings. Anyway. So this uh, associated infection um, is saying, oh yeah, really simple removed, I, I think it, it might, might be susceptible, infection, infected, um, susceptible, I, I can't recall at this, uh, I'm pretty sure it's removed, yeah. It has the usual parameters, so there's just like a beta transmission parameter that determines the rate at which susceptible people become infected, and then a gamma parameter that determines the rate at which infected people um, become, excuse me, become recovered or removed. Um, and uh, and using that kind of that notion on on the uh, the network, they wanted to derive a measure that's kind of analogous to the R naught, um, so analogous to the basic reproductive number. They call it R naught phi, which is appropriate, right? The thing is, they want an expression for this that includes phi. Is the idea? Uh, so, <coughs> excuse me. This this goes via a, a bit of algebraic work, um, some of which I have skipped. <coughs> excuse me, um, but. Uh, I, I guess some of the, the sign posts in the or milestones in the middle of this are, uh, are this notion of uh, R of SI. Uh, so that's the, uh, the expected number of infections caused by an individual with strength SI. Re uh, remember that uh, SI is the strength of I, which is the sum of the weights at I. So that's, uh, that's not the number of partners, that's the sum of all of the, the weighted partnerships. Um, so uh, I, I contacted you and actually asking him about wh why this was R of SI and not R of I, uh, and, uh, and it really it really could be either is our conclusion. But we thought this was notationally prettier. Um, anyhow, so this is the expected number of infections caused by an individual with this with this strength. Uh, and then they to make their lives analytically easier, they look at first an, a fairly unrealistic case, and that's one where all nodes have identical strength. So everyone say has the same amount of socialness to give and they just distribute it differently, right? But they have the to same total amount of socialness uh, available. Um, and that's that strength S. And therefore, uh, this, excuse me, this new um, measure that they're looking at would be equal to this, right? So there, there are not phi is equal to R of S here in this situation where everyone has the same strength. So then, then I mentioned beta is the transmission parameter. Um, and, and so in this setting, then they also make another assumption, and that's that uh, they're going to treat beta as if it's a transmission parameter uh, for if every interaction were between individuals who had never met before, right? Um, kind of taking the network to the limit, right? Looking at contrasting what we're going to get uh, for this measure with what you would get for that measure if that phi were infinite, if, if everybody only met people who they had never met before ever. What they do using this is, are, are, is make some plots uh, where you end up with ratios between R naught phi and R naught infinite, right? To contrast these two, these two situations. Okay, as I said, I, I, missed, I, I, I skipped out a fair bit of kind of algebraic manipulation there. 
um, I, I always want to be cautious when I say that, right? I used to, I used to do the classic mathematician thing, I think, and say like, and then, you know, it's eh, some straightforward algebra. It's never straightforward when I try and do it, right? Like I, I, I always find it difficult to find the, the right way to go. So I, what I want to say here is with some work, not with, not with just, it's not obvious uh, to me at all. Um, but, uh, but it's there if you want to, if you want to peruse it. Um, and so these experiments then uh, are about contrasting um, for different uh, for different settings of phi, what the ratio between this measure for that phi and the measure for infinite phi is over different population sizes, with the general conclusion, and I'll go through this on the figure, that uh, this measure is uh, highly sensitive to changes in the population size at high social fluidity but not so much at low social fluidity. And that's where that frequency dependence versus density dependence uh, infection, um, infection process comes into it. But I'll, I'll, I'll talk you through that. So first let's, let's, let's have a look at this figure and see how we can really see this, this sensitivity to changes in N for, for high phi. Excuse me. Uh, so here we have, let's see, uh, the highest one is 1.6. So that's uh, for, for some sensible definition, much bigger than one, I suppose. Uh, so for high social fluidity, um, they take this ratio here. Uh, so if if this ratio is is very uh, very big, then uh, yeah, then then r um, r not phi is uh, is is big with relation to or is similar to uh, r not infinite. Okay, and so to increase the population, it gets really big, right? So so there we go. Uh, r not uh, kind of goes up and approaches that this ratio approach is one. But on the other hand, if we have really low social fluidity, um, then it, it stays super different, right? So, uh, and it doesn't, and it doesn't, oh, sorry, my internet connection is not great. Uh, and it doesn't change very much over time, right? So once we're out of this really low population size regime, this stays the same, whereas it takes a wee bit longer for this red line. So let me let me try and let me try and interpret um, what I think that that means. And if if you think I've got it wrong, feel free to disagree in the in, in the chat. Um, so we know from other infection processes and studies and graduate courses uh, that if you have an infection that is spreading, for example, between individuals who are laid out in the plane and only have contact with their neighbors, that is is um, that is density dependent. By which we mean um, what's I'm oversimplifying here, but what's bounding the spread of the infection is is how close together contacts are, right? How how um, how available susceptible individuals are, right? That's the density of of susceptible individuals. Gosh, I hope I've got this the right way around. Sometimes I reverse it, and if I'm doing that, someone please shout. Whereas, if you're allowed to have these really long distance uh, contacts, right? Like back in the world when I was allowed to fly anywhere that I wanted. Uh, then, then the spread of a contagion might depend more on how frequently I contact people. So if I contact people willy-nilly, so I have really high social fluidity, then what is, what is, um, what is slowing or what is, uh, what is bounding the spread of the disease is the number of different contacts I have. Um, so that's, that's the, the core idea here. Is it the number of contacts uh, kind of in the happening or is it this local density effect, right? So that's an important thing. And again, it makes total sense um, in terms of the social fluidity versus uh, versus totally uh, social, uh, sorry, so loyalty versus not loyalty situation. Okay. All right, so let's move on from that. Um, that was a really simple situation, right? Where everyone has the same strength. Everyone has the same social uh, weighted, excuse me, weighted degree. So they, they then uh, went looking at a, at a different situation where there's heterogeneous connectivity, right? So different, different numbers of connections, different strength of connection, sorry, which is um, definitely more realistic. Uh, and they, they defined this, this other analog, R not uh, S. Um, can I remember what S stands for? No, I cannot, sorry. Shout it out if anyone knows in the, in the chat. Um, and it's a function of a bunch of stuff. Uh, some of these things are uh, tau, beta, and gamma. These are disease parameters. Uh, so uh, this will be a function of the disease process. That's not a surprise. And a function also of the strengths uh, and of the degrees. To remind you there, that's, that's this 
weighted, that's the strength, and the, the Ki is just the degrees, uh, which are um, just number of partners uh, not paying attention to, to the strength of those interactions. So they define this, this uh, additional analog, um, which, uh, which they compute in this way, excuse me. Uh, and the really neat thing about this one is that it correlates really well with simulated infection. Um, they do a trick where essentially they compute like only kind of one to another generation of, of disease. And in the first generation of disease, which is really what this not is for, right? Our not kind of only applies in the first, if you're being strict about it, in the first generation of disease after time zero or time not, it's no longer our not, it's our something else. Anyhow, um, and when they run a couple uh, simulated disease uh, things on their various networks, they find that this correlates very, very well um, with their simulated infection uh, better than some other things that they, that they check. Now, to finish off, because um, I wanted to leave time for uh, or, or pointing out other things people thought were good or bad or interesting, I wanted to show you this slightly more informal, nice version of some of the things that I've said. So this is, this is uh, I mentioned Ewan before, Ewan Coleman is the first author, um, and despite not being female, still a good person. Um, so I'm going to open this and then I'm going to share the screen of, of this uh, kind of uh, Twitter thread uh, because it's, it's got some nice examples in there that I find really uh, informative. So give me a second. Let me just change my screen sharing. I'm going to turn it off and turn it on again. Don't be alarmed. Okay. Uh, here we go. All right. Uh, can you see the, the Twitter thread? Thumbs up for me? Yes, good, okay. So uh, uh, here uh, Ewan is, uh, excuse me, uh, he's talking about, uh, he's talking about, it was just after, uh, I, like, I like how the, the UK government is slightly more uh, French in his spelling than they usually are. I'm sure they would appreciate that at this moment. Um, so after the uh, UK government was doing Kind of, uh, in my opinion, slightly dubious uh, COVID control. He wanted to, to talk about this paper a little bit. And he starts by going through uh, some of the figures that we looked at. And then he does this thing, which I think is really, is really snazzy and really explains the whole point of this really cleverly. So he contrasts the, uh, the style of different kinds of animals, plus there are animal pictures. And then at the end talks about how really what we want COVID is than the other. Aggressive, uh, they fight for territory. Not to repeat interaction with when you're when you're fighting. Vampire. Uh, so. Uh, and go right? so, um, where for us, kind of a split situation. I think we lost Jeff just now, haven't we? Let's see if she if she comes back online. Sorry about that. Hi, Jess. Yeah, sorry, fell off the internet. <laughs> Let me bring that back. There we go. Okay, if, we're if, back you could, if you could skip back uh, like a few seconds in what you were saying, because I think we lost you a bit earlier than uh, sure. when you, you were officially. Hear about the, did you hear about the bats? Did we finish with the bats? When um, I think we finished. We were at the parakeets when, when we lost. Ah, uh, no. Okay. So the parakeets are aggressive, is the short version. Uh, and as their social effort, grows, their number of partners grows really quickly, right? Because they're aggressive, because most of their new interactions are with new people. Because look at them, little jerks, rawr, right? I mean, nobody, that's not nice. Um, whereas he contrasts them to vampire bats, which he says are honest, decent folk who repay the favors they receive. They give food back to people who've given them food before. Uh, they have persistent social bonds. And because of this, as their social effort increases over time, um, or the, the sum of their social effort, excuse me, increases over time, the number of social bonds they have goes up relatively slowly because most of their social effort is, is spent on their vampire bat friends who fed them before, which is really nice. And macaques, 
have a split between those two. They have aggressive behaviors that the curve goes like the parakeets, uh, but when they're grooming, you might remember from that, that figure that we saw at the beginning of the paper, when they're grooming, they have those persistent bonds, right? Where they invest more effort into the, part, uh, the, the social bonds that they've had before, increasing the strength of their edges rather than increasing the number of their edges, yeah? Um, which, is, which is really nice. And then he goes on in this tweet to kind of characterize uh, this, this measure a little bit. Um, and then here's a bit that I think is really cool. Then he does this little, this little description of, of what this kind of in practice means, um, saying that, you know, when you simulate this sort of disease, this social fluidity makes a really big difference. And so what do we want to do with this social fluidity uh, to reduce transmission? And it's common sense stuff, right? Reduce the social fluidity, less like parakeets, more like vampire bats, right? Um, try and invest more of your social effort on fewer people uh, to get you through the, the lockdown is essentially what he's saying. And I think that's, I think that's really lovely, right? I thought that's a really, a really kind of nice way to, um, to summarize that paper. Screen sharing uh, there. If people want to talk about the paper or look for particular bits of it, I can get a version of the paper and open it up. Jess, are we losing you again? Um, possible. Here, let me turn off my video. Okay. You can probably, that's, that's probably more okay. reliable. Yeah, there you go. I, uh, so what I was saying is that if yeah. you would like, I can share a copy or you can share a copy. I think your internet is more reliable if people have things yeah, that they would me, like to see. Let me see if I, if I have it and then, then open it up. Um, But you can continue talking. I'll, I'll pull it up as soon as I find it. Oh, I'm, I am, yeah, I am basically uh, done talking. So I wanted to do a, awesome. kind of a, a general overview of the of the thing, and then and then show you this this nice tweet summary, uh, and then leave some time for people to uh, say what they thought of it, good bits, bad bits, questions that hopefully collectively we can answer. Which means people would need to have opinions or say things on the chat or raise their hand if you use that mechanism, because uh, otherwise we'll just sit mm -hmm. here staring at uh, Alice's so, um, lovely visage. Uh, it is lovely, isn't it? So I'm going to, to you'll have to uh, <laughs> see my screen for a bit from, from now on. I'm going to share the paper. Here it is. Um, Okay, so uh, Jess, I I actually have lots of questions, and some of them might be uh, very basic because I'm not in the business of modeling diseases at all. Um, but I was wondering, so there's there's lots of studies, so there's lots of data on um, uh, the animal social networks, and um, I was wondering when you get a result like this, what are are there implications that uh, apply to both people and animals alike, or is it is, is one of the results that you have very different effects and different uh, social networks? Mm. So my opinion on that is that often it's the case, because mm. as you know, I do mostly animal stuff, right? Um, often it's the case, particularly when you're looking at livestock things, that the conclusions you draw and the interventions you can do and the measures you make don't apply to humans because they're related to either quality of data that we don't have or they're related to interventions that we can't make, right? So like mm -hmm. if I come up with a measure that is something like um, how, how susceptible is this network to disease uh, if we know we can... Uh, kill everything within five miles of the first case, for example. That's an extreme example. Um, that's a measure that doesn't really apply to human networks. Now, like sometimes you can say, well, instead of killing them, you can vaccinate everyone or, or whatever. But yeah, often it's not really suitable. This one, I think it's just a vanilla social mobility kind of, or sorry, social fluidity uh, measure. So I, I don't really see why it, why it doesn't apply. Um, on the other hand, uh, 
yeah, you often can't, well, I was about to say you can't modify human networks that much, but man, <laughs> are we ever modifying human networks right now? So I, I think this one is relatively applicable in, yeah. So Joel was asking Joel uh, on the chat about, um, uh, about uh, the fit. Joel, you're talking about the fit between, um, uh, you're talking about the, the fit that, that looks at the different kinds of interactions or at the kind of comparison between our not estimated and, uh, and the disease simulation. Oh, sorry, just on uh, how well they fit the social fluidity. Because, I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. To make that nice, that nice figure with all the different kinds of interaction, that one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I definitely didn't show anything about that, so you didn't, you didn't miss anything. Um, I'm trying to recall what's in there. It's been a long day. I don't think, I don't think there was anything. Um, there was, there's nothing that that springs to mind that was in the paper. On the other hand, uh, I. I know that it's a very compact version of the paper and that there's some some extra, um, what's the word here, a supplementary material hanging out somewhere. Uh, so to get this right, like with every paper, right? Like we only see this kind of last version of it. Um, and I love the fact that I was looking, so this is the first version of have seen and I read it and, and really liked it and had the advantage of having uh, this first, this first author is someone I know. And so I was just, and we're working together on some COVID stuff. And so I just like message him on, on Teams or Slack or whatever tool it is our universities have decided that we're using this week and said like, well, what does this mean? Why, where is this? And so I kind of got to hear, after seeing the last version of the paper, I kind of got to hear the story of how it like came together. Um, and I think this paper used to be quite a bit longer <laughs> and that because of where they're looking to submit it, they have uh, made it really, really compact and taken out a lot of stuff. Also, I don't think, no, I don't think they discussed uh, the, um, the sensitivity of the fit to uh, weak ties. You mean like weak edges there, right, Joel? Yeah, I mean, because uh, like those are things where I think in data, it'd be hard to capture, but those can change what a distribution looks like a whole lot, right? Like if you have just a whole lot of really weak ties or if we're not a whole lot of weak ties. Yeah, I, I don't think there's anything about that. There is a section a little bit on dealing with, um, so they have a, a little discussion of uh, of the differences in the different kind of types of data, right? That that really the contacts mean really different things. And I'm wondering if there's something in there that will help us out. That's the song I sing when I'm scrolling through a paper, apparently. Da -da 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 um, you want me to scroll with you? Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. Okay, so that's uh, about the disease thing. Uh, fitting. Yeah, so there's a note of how it's fit. It's the um, total squared squared error between the observed degrees and their expectation given by the model. That's just me reading. I haven't remembered that. Um, but there's not a lot of detail in here about about how good that was or any sort of sensitivity. So under under if you could go, Alice, to the end in materials and methods to section B, I'm just I'm just gonna see if there's anything that's that's helpful in there. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Uh, yeah. Um, that there's just this discussion of a little bit of like excluding yeah, how they, for human contact, they excluded contacts that were very brief in an attempt to get rid of some of those weak ties. So there's that mention of it. Um, but yeah, I don't see much else on there. So, so what's the justification for excluding weak ties? Uh, they wanted to exclude contacts where people in the human data set, it was mm -hmm. to, um, yeah, sensor noise, good call. Yeah, or people like walking, the example they gave is people walking briefly past one another. They didn't um, want to include that as, as interaction because they didn't consider it. This was about social interaction. And so, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. let's see. And Sophie says, isn't it surprising there's no correlation between mean number of interactions per individual and social fluidity? Is there not? mean number of interactions per person and social fluidity. 
Uh, okay. There's something about this. So weight variability and mean degree are uncorrelated with each other, but, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm looking at uh, Alice on kind of line, what yeah. is it, 177, which is page uh, down, go down to the next page, just under the figure on the right hand mm -hmm. column. This one. is one of the things I they they said uh, up up no previous page sorry one seventy seven so that would be uh, why why is it two oh nine and one seven oh it's on, on in the other column right wait too many minutes. so one seventy seven that would be here right um yeah there you go you're uh no up more sorry up more yeah it's the yeah. Sorry about this. Okay, here we go. Yeah. Okay. So there's, I sort of, I sort of skated past this, but um, there's some discussion on this page uh, of the correlations here, right? That they say one of the, one of the cool things that they like is that, um, okay, okay, weight variability and mean degree are uncorrelated, but both of those are correlated to this measure, I, th I think, if I'm reading this correctly. Which what seemed crazy to me. Um, so I'm back at figure two. Oh no, I see. I see what Anne Sophie is seeing. Yeah, on line 174, which is the left-hand column, it says there's no significant there's correlation no sig between the mean number of interactions per individual. Yeah, and social fluidity, which implies that sampling bias. Yeah, no. Yeah, that may be surprising. Let me think about that for a second. No significant correlation between the mean number of interactions per individual and social fluidity. That does anybody have a conjecture for why this might be? Yeah, I, I don't know. I would initially expect that uh, since the social fluidity is, um, yeah, in one case, like having a lot of interactions, but uh, but but not repeated, and in the other case, having a few interaction, but uh, with a higher frequency. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I just find it surprising. <laughs> yeah, and and Yoon even says in that tweet that this is one of the characteristics, right? That for the parakeets, remember, as time goes on, they have more interactions because most of their interactions. Oh, wait a minute. Between the mean number of interactions per individual, yeah. So that's that weighted measure. Hmm. I mean, this is sort of saying that this is sort of saying that there's kind of a this uniform amount of socialness that you're willing to disperse, you know, assign to different people. Let's see. Joel says, I think it was set up so those quantities would not be related. It could be. It, that's certainly the case in the earlier example that they deal with, the simpler setting. Yeah. I don't know. But, but I think it kind of depends on, on the setup and I, I might have missed some of the details in the beginning. Uh, I think it really depends on how exactly you define social fluidity because it's, it's just a, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't change the overall number of contacts, right? It only changes how, how I distribute the, the contacts that I might have throughout the day over different people, whether I have them all with my husband or whether I have them with lots of people at a party or in the supermarket or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and social fluidity is a property of the entire system, right? It's not for an individual. Yeah, that's correct. Mm. Yeah. Is or I believe that to be a correct, anyway. Is there something in the model that um, lets you tweak the um, how many individuals might be very, um, what was it, gregarious or allegiant? Is, is, that, mm -hmm. is that what you're doing by when tweaking social flu uh, fluidity or is, uh, is social fluidity kind of raising the average or something like that for all individuals? No, I think it's, 
I think it's the distribution of it's a distribution of these pairwise probabilities. Okay. Right? Yeah. So it's a it's a pro property of the overall of the overall system. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have low social fluidity, then uh, let me think about this carefully before I say things. Let me say about this. Could you go up to figure one and we'll mm -hmm. see if we can, the figure one and the, and the expression number two that is right below it. Yeah, there you go. So, yeah. So here we have, I'm looking at the little distribution pictures on the right. So X, uh, XJ given I is the probability that J will be involved in an edge given that I is involved in an edge. Mm -hmm. um, so, so if social fluidity is very high, as in that top one, then we have a uh, kind of a lot of them where that's a, a uh, let's see, for a lot of them it's low prob. Yes, that's the right way around. But a lot of them is low probability, and for a few it's high, and then and then it's people have more persistent social ties in the in that bottom one, mm -hmm. right? So I've totally forgotten what I was supposed to be figuring out. Oh, well, just so, so I'm trying to figure out uh, what it means for the individuals. So what? It, so so this is this this is defined on the level of the whole system. Uh, so within the whole system, I, I suppose given for the probability given any i and any j, mm -hmm. uh, what's the probability that i and j will have an interaction, right? So, and this this might be different if you fix i or j, because you yeah. have some individuals that are more gregarious yeah. and some that are more allegiant. And I'm trying to find out um, what in this model um, fixes or tells us something, or what what assumptions are made in terms of how many allegiant and how many gregarious individuals do you have. Is there a distribution of that that kind of comes about in the model, or is there some assumption that was made? Yeah, it's a good question. So that question didn't even occur to me because I think the whole thing is sort of set up with this notion that that your system, not everyone has exactly the beha same behavior, but that mm -hmm. there's kind of there are like allegiant systems and there are gregarious systems, um, oh, which okay. of course so in that, real that, data that's is a system you know, property as well. So that's not a node property. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but someone, yeah, as, as usual, someone shout on the chat if it's, but like, like that's, Alex, it's not a question I thought about because it didn't, it kind of didn't occur to me. So that's, right. I wouldn't take that answer as totally authoritative. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> it's like in terms of, I, I know what my friends are doing, uh, doing during lockdown. Um, very different things. People are struggling in different ways. Yeah. Um, some people have maybe a more allegiant or more gregarious nature to them and are kind of grown off more or less by what's happening right now. Yeah. So do yeah, that's yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I just I just don't want to kind of um, take the stage away from from everyone. So we have a few minutes left if if people have other comments or questions hi joel hi joel nice to see you <laughs> yeah sorry, sorry, I'm on camera earlier. yeah I, I guess to me it's sort of like so like the open modeling question to me is like so i like the paper but it's sort of like unclear to me like can a single parameter really capture like all the distributions that we would want over interactions across edges? And you know, when you think back to like, I think Dunbar's original paper, right? Like that was sort of like this like hierarchical thing where there were several different Dunbar numbers describing like several different like, like stages of like, you know, strength of connection, right? And, um, you know, I, I just kind of wonder like maybe there isn't some sort of like Another sort of like hierarchical model that'd be interesting, or does or does yes. this one way does equation two capture Dunbar pretty well? It's like I think that's an interesting question. 
So I wonder, Joel, if like that kind of interfaces nicely with the question Alice was asking. So like, I don't know how well this thing would capture a population where there were some people who are super or some individuals super gregarious and some people really, excuse me, a legion. I don't know how that would work with, with this at all. So like, for example, in that tweet, remember there was like, I, I mentioned the macaque case where they, where they separate, where there are these two different different kinds of things. But if you remember from the figure, they analyzed those data sets separately, right? Like there was the data set that was aggression that had more gregarious and there was the data set that was grooming that came out as a legion. It's not the case that it was the one data set and it somehow got separated. Um, yeah, and in animal data, I guess, you know, on Alice's point, like, you know, there's probably gonna be sex differences between like, you know, territorial animals on like, yeah, that sort of interaction data. I have the power to find out what would happen. I mean, we could just put some of those together and, and see and see how this goes. Or I could ask I could ask the guy who ran these ones to do it for me. That sounds like even less work uh, to see what happens. I just find it really interesting because it, um, it's so topical and uh, uh, it definitely, I've, I've been having discussions with, with friends about um, whether it's actually necessary to every, for everyone to be in lockdown, whether you could have a few uh, kind of find out who's your favorite friends, your favorite yeah. friends and just meet up with them, whether that be okay or not okay. Um, so, so this is a thing that I can talk a little, a little bit because it's mm -hmm. it's my day job, right? So, yeah. uh, and I'm I'm aware we're running we're running out of time. But to, to comment on that issue, so I was uh, the 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 group I was in all day today, and I'm in all day tomorrow, is a, a study group trying to look at mathematical principles for uh, the kind of end of lockdown world, like the world where we're we have relatively the we call it the cold scenario as opposed to hot scenario that we have right now, right? Where there's not too much infection around. And what is it possible to do? And there are a bunch of countries that are essentially doing this, right? So um, New Zealand is attempting it, uh, a couple of Canadian provinces, so New Brunswick is proposing this. It's, they call it the two household bu bubble, that you're supposed to just identify one other household strictly that you include in your epidemiological bubble. Uh, and then as long as you're strictly loyal, so strictly allegiant, I guess in this paper to, to your small set of things, you just become a little clique. You become like one epidemiological unit. And the risk there, the really bad thing that can happen there that you probably have definitely already thought of, right, is that if you have a bunch of these little cliques, how many edges do you people who either intentionally or unintentionally breaking the bubble <laughs> uh, to end up with a giant component? And it's not mm -hmm. that many um, in the usual percolation kind of way, right? Uh, but if you like, if, if for example, especially if you're geographically local, like if I really liked my downstairs neighbors, I don't, I mean, they're fine people, but I, I wouldn't want to be in a bubble with them. Uh, and we just kind of never shut the door between the places, then, then this should be kind of not a lot epidemiologically worse. So that's at a micro scale, at a macro scale, this kind of ends up to be, uh, ends up with the notion of regionalization, um, which people who work on animal diseases will be really familiar with. And that's this idea that um, if there are places that are kind of special and low prevalence, you can separate them into their own epidemiological unit, treat them as if they're one thing, and then cut off all ties to everywhere, everywhere else, right? So mm -hmm. for example, like are there islands that could come out of lockdown sooner? Um, because you can regionalize and, and say, well, they're sort of their own special thing. If you treat them as one epidemiological unit, they're totally free of disease and yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I wonder, yeah, so if we were, we had a debate today actually in the, in the group I was talking about, but whether um, if you had a graph um, or a network describing contacts of people at work, do you want, uh, do you want not the smallest, but pretty small cliques, or do you want a tree in terms of, mm. in terms of expected disease risk? Uh, and it depends so much on the disease. Right, right? yeah. Um, but yeah, sorry, I, I really, I, I uh, yeah, it's what's on my mind. <laughs> it's it's, it's on, on, on many people's minds, I think. Lots of questions. Well, um, I think maybe we wrap it up now. Uh, 
thank you so much, Jess, for, for this introduction to, to this paper and um, uh, letting me ask all my uh, very novice questions on the topic. Uh, and then um, I'll see you all again next week for another seminar. Take care. Yeah. Stay safe. Thanks, everyone. Had a great time. Bye-bye. I will. Ah, oh, she's gone or else I'd show you. <laughs> Next time. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.